Welcome, welcome everybody to another episode of Founders Talks, where we talk to founders about how they got started and where they're going. For today's episode, we have the very, very, very charismatic, energetic founder of Bonita Payments, Elliot Foreman. Phenomenal story, as a lot of payments professionals who decided to forge their own path, he began the forefront of one of the giants, First Data. So without further ado, I'll introduce you guys to Mr. Foreman. Mr. Foreman, thank you, thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. Absolutely. So why don't we get started with, you know, how did you get started with Bonita? Where is your journey with payments began? And where are you today? Well, um, like most small business owners, medium-sized business owners, I'm in the thick. Every day is a day in the trenches, but you know, my story started with me working at First Data. I was recruited a long time ago, 16 years ago. Uh, started selling payment processing. Uh, you learn the ins and outs of interchange plus rate and transaction, things like that. And so I was very fortunate to be able to get that undergraduate level of study from the best, the biggest, the pink elephant in the room, the giant, so to speak. And so I did that for a little bit more than 10 years, right, right around 10 years. And then there came an opportunity for me to start looking for different things for my own personal life, my own personal career. Uh, someone asked me at that 10 year mark if I were planning to stay in payments. And I said, you're, you're damn right. There's no reason for me to give it a decade and then get out and go sell cars. Right. So one thing led to another. I started looking at the independent route. I started looking at, you know, maybe working for another outfit or something like that. And then before you know it, I said, you know what? I think I want to give it I want to give it my own go. This was my first time ever starting my own business. So it, w it came with a lot of challenges. Did I have enough funding? You know, what was my first year going to look like? You know, was I going to have a two year slump where it just didn't work at all or whatever the case might be? And so I am grateful that I can knock on the door of any small business in America and say, hey, my name is Elliot Foreman. Here's my story. Would you like to do business with me? I was fortunate enough to forge a relationship to where I was able to sell the same exact things that I had sold for my current my previous employer uh, for the first 10 years. So I literally didn't miss a beat knew the product, knew what you were selling, very charismatic, so relatively easy for you. In the same market, in the, same. In, the, in the very same market. So that meant a lot to me that I had already had some credibility and so now I was gonna be able to do my own, my own thing. And so that's pretty much how I got into founding Bonita Payments right at six years ago. So how was the transition? You know, you're selling you know, for one of the biggest, baddest, best companies in, in the payments industry. Um, what is it, one in two transactions, something along those lines goes through first data. Uh, how was the transition between, you know, being backed by a giant organization and a big name like first data is in the payment space to you having to come out here and this is, this is your own shop? Um, well, first of all, they have a big checkbook. And so that means whatever you sell, you don't worry about anything other than just the recurring money on the other side of the transaction. Well, when you own your own operation, you have to front so much of the working capital, the, you know, the, the process, everything is going to be counted, you know, whereas before I would, I had a blank check. Now I actually do have a true check and I need to know exactly how much money I have because I couldn't go and sell a thousand Clover stations without having to account for that. And so that means, do you start your business with a loan? Okay. Let's talk about that. You're a small business. You are an amazing chef. You want to start selling great fried chicken in New Orleans tomorrow, well, you're gonna to have to buy $20,000 in inventory. You're gonna to have to have real estate. You're gonna to have to have licensing, a tax strategy, employee strategy. You're gonna to have to have, you know, a, a litany of things that are gonna, you know, make you not necessarily be successful right away because you're starting from a financial deficit. And my story was no different. But what I did do is I built it one customer at a time, every single day, very slowly until it got the momentum of the snowball effect. So you go one merchant, two merchant, four merchant, six merchant, eight merchant, 10 merchant. And that's the way it goes. And you don't get the money right away. It takes a long time before you start to see a profit. And that's why I knew these things going in, but because I was already a payments expert, the sky's the limit. So how, how did you, you know, explore a little further on, uh, on what you just mentioned. Uh, you know, I can imagine there were some challenges mm -hmm. when you first got started. Yeah. Um, wh what kept you going? What, you know, what didn't, you know, despite the no's and the discouragement, you know, 
how did you keep going and keep the same you know attitude that you have today you know when you were knocking on those merchants doors i'll be for, i'll be totally honest with you i was afraid at first yeah. i was afraid at first i had a lot of support a lot of family support um my partner and, and, and best friend Ramon literally, you know, kind of kept the wheels moving a little bit. Sometimes we needed gas money. Sometimes we needed lunch money. You know, we all have those small struggle stories. But like I said, I just figured out a way to continuously work the angle of a little, a little, a little more, a little bit more. And, and that's just that's what's called bootstrapping and grassroots is when you sell one thing at a time until you can control more of the sale dynamic, until you can keep more of the profit, until you can do more and offer your clients more. So if I sell a customer a credit card machine, then I may sell them a perks program or a maybe offer them some working capital or maybe do some other things. And so the point I'm making is that you just continue to sell until you're in control of much more, you're offering much more, your value proposition is in place. Listen, any small business, that is in business in B2B business, working to scale themselves, they literally, if they are like me, they're intrinsic, they're into it, they're serious, they're focused, they're paying attention to the details, they're working to become better. You know, there's no play hide in the sand type of thing. I mean, my customers depend on me, so the idea is to be the best version of myself to read everything I can get my hands on, to watch every YouTube, to listen to every podcast. If I'm in my car, I'm not listening to rap music. I'm literally trying to get more information, to acquire more, to be better. Because at some point, Bonita now, through its evolution, we are business engineers, business architects, business finance angles. We do so much more than just rates and fees because this is the motive, I'm sorry, this is our operating method that we've evolved into over the years of seeing what the need was. We know what the biggest needs in the small to medium sized businesses are. It's funding, it's opportunity, it's access to technology. It's the things that keep them from reaching their full potential. And so it's our job to curate that and to offer it to them. I love that you touched upon that because I feel that the best in this industry don't just go and sell rates. They go beyond that and actually what we call, you know, going beyond payments mm -hmm. um, where it's you, you need working capital, we'll offer you cash advance. Mm -hmm. Do you need a new station to manage your inventory? You have that covered for you. Uh, what, what made you go, was that part of the Bonita original offering or did this evolve mm -hmm. as you matured as a, you know, independent business leader and as you encountered more perhaps more clients along the way? Was this something that gradually evolved over time or was this your vision all along that, hey, I'm not here to only provide payments, I'm here to provide you with solutions to your problems? Let me just say this. Any business owner that tells you that they knew on day one what they look like on day, on t on day, day one 10 years later, I'll think they're lying. Because for me, my, my number one goal was pay some bills, yeah. keep the lights on, be able to deliver on what it is we sell okay so that would evolve into you know a six-year company that's much more mature so all that being said i didn't know exactly where we would be at i still don't know where we're going at because i'm not just blowing with the wind but i am taking the evolutionary steps that would be able to give me more to offer more to do more to be more to be a better version of a payments partner because we are a payments partner that's different we don't just like you say have a call center that inundates people's phones with, hey, we can save you some money, or Visa MasterCard's coming out with a new offering and you're gonna be qualified for it, so give me your social security number and we're gonna send you a machine with a terrible a rate package and an uncancelable lease that's gonna do you something terrible for the rest of your life. And no, so the evolution was my customers, you pay attention to your customers. They're gonna tell you what they need. You need to pay attention to their struggles so that you can know what you can do and offer them if someone comes to my customer and they offer them something that should have been within my purview, within maybe a window of opportunity for me, then that means that I'm not listening to them and I'm not, I'm not having deep enough conversations to ask them what keeps them up at night, so to speak. So um, it is an evolution. I am learning every day. I am paying attention. Your, your worst customers are your greatest source of learning. And so it's just a process of paying attention, being vigilant, being smart and doing whatever you can do to stay alive. I love that you brought that point of 
evolution because you know as business leaders we have to be constantly evolving uh, or else we get left behind you know and we, even we've seen in the last couple of years the evolution in payments you know a lot of these technologies had been around yet the demand for them wasn't there until something came an externality or a shock that pretty much made everyone uh, demand NFC technology or contactless payments where it had been there all along uh, I'm curious to get your point of view in terms of, you know, where do you see the future of payments evolving towards and, and where does Bonita Payments fit into that new payments landscape uh, that will emerge from not only the pandemic, but from the shifting in consumer behaviors that we're seeing today? Okay, so listen, payments are doing a lot of chaotic things, but yet still find its way to have some level of stability. Number one, wherever there's money, there's fraud. OK, so for every speeding car, there's a radar detector and somebody trying to enforce that level of regulation. So payments are looking to become more safe, safer, rather. They're looking to become more digital, more instant. And um, the exchange needs to happen in the normal, natural cycle of what pay is. OK, then you have stuff like decentralized payment systems, you know, cryptocurrency, whatever the case might be. Well, number one, Bonita will be listening to whatever is happening and finding a way to be on the front side of it and not the back side of it. We, sh we, sh we should be able to offer whatever is available and what isn't available, maybe we can look at maybe, you know, developing a way to be able to put ourselves in a position to do something like that. So people who can find a way to be on the front side of the technology are disruptors or they're just very gifted or they got a lot of money behind them. And what I mean by that is, do we currently have the time to think of what's happening 10 years from now or do you think my best move would be to spend the lion's share of my time, my financial energy and all of my IQ on being able to provide the best that's available right now? And for me, being a service based industry, a service based business, a customer centric kind of business, I believe that people are being so mistreated out there by their partners and the people that they do business with that we can make we can make a trillion dollars a year just picking up the loose pieces of bad customer service out here. And so when you ask me the future of payments, yes, they're going digital, they're getting faster, they're getting safer, potentially. Um, I think they're gonna be even less contact than what they currently are. You know, We're seeing people in restaurants that never ever get a bill, they're just paying on kiosks right, right. on the table. I mean, so, you know, um, you know if, if, if the labor force is doing anything today, Humans in your business, they bring a certain set of problems and certain set of advantages. And so when you see things like drones trying to deliver groceries or you see uh, nobody in the store and you're walking by and you can pick up anything you want to and walk out, but you're just scanning with an app and you're paying. So where's the human inter inter intervention? You know, um, businesses are closed. Airline companies are not flying because they don't have people to actually fly. If these major corporations keep getting let down by human beings, then eventually we're going to be going towards an, an AI conversation that maybe nobody wants to have. What happened to being able to go and meet your favorite waitress or get a drink from your favorite bartender or your car getting washed by the guy who does it so well for you or whatever the case is? The car wash got it, it, it attempt to it attempted to replace the guy who washes your car sometimes that's why you pay a premium to get your car hand wash and not go through the machine like everybody well guess what you're going to pay seven dollars and do it in five minutes or you're going to pay seventy dollars and it's going to take you a half the day you're going to have to figure out the, these are so when you speak of payment evolutions these are things that we are all seeing these things happen they're happening they're constantly happening you're either going to be a part of the change or you're going to get left behind uh, I completely agree. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, at the same time, I feel, you know, you touched about a, a little bit about fear um, and also being about the, the forefront of technology and change. Um, I feel that for, for any individual, you know, business leader to be at the forefront of anything, you know, tolerance for risk has to be very high and at the same time almost be fearless in a sense because you are the first. Uh, how, how do you say, you know, so a young professional, you know, a young payments professional that is coming in or a new entrepreneur that would like to take a risk. How, how do you manage or balance the, the two? I think that if you're going to go into the coffee business, go work at Starbucks. Go find out how they know everyone's name. 
how they can make a drink in six minutes, how they're doing their entire operation automated with contactless payments and nice smiles and just moving forward. Go find out. So if I were a payments prospect that's getting ready to start, I would definitely say go cut your teeth in some other ISO, some other organization that you can learn some sales skills. Go find out how to price customers. Go find out what, what it is to have your phone ring all day, every day, 17 to 50 times a day, 100 emails, constant, constant, constant resolution center 101. Go find out what it means to be an independent payment processor that writes deals, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover, every single possible way to take a credit card payment or more or whatever the case may be. Go find out what it is. Go find out what it is to sell hardware, software, solutions, online e-commerce. Go learn the language. If you think you're going to just get out here and you're going to be able to pull that curve in a 24-month period, it doesn't work that way. You've got to put skin in the game in order to deserve to be in the game. <laughs> Beautifully put, very beautifully put. And, and on that tip, you know, well, you know, you've been fairly, you know, been around for over 15 years, yes. you know, uh, successful at the end of the day. I mean, call it what you call it, very humble, I would say. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, a, a lot of businesses wish to see even three years, two years of existence. Yes. Yes. You made it way past that point, you know, so, so as a young entrepreneur myself, I, I wonder, you know, what are some of the words of wisdom or or even encouragement that not only you can share with myself, but the next generation of entrepreneurs who may be following on your footsteps at the end of the day. Um, where's the wisdom to, to a new aspiring entrepreneur? Um, number one, read all the top 10 books of everything that they say that you need to know before you do whatever it is that you're trying to do. And I mean, I can't stress that enough. You should read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You should read Think and Grow Rich, How to Win Friends and Influence People. You should read The Laws of Power. You should read all those things because, listen, these are things, okay, listen, there's nothing new under the sun. I think that's like biblical, but y did you know that? Yeah, I I'm laughing because I, I read all those books. So it was like, it's like, yeah, I did what. So you have to have some sort of a, a, a framework of reference to be able a, a to. A North Star, a North Star You have for to that have matter, something. Yeah. Yeah. OK, yeah. what do you do when the day is just terrible? OK, you know what you do? You go to sleep and you get up and you start over again. You yeah. know, you, you just I mean, y you know, everything that we see in this world was thought of by someone. OK, I was telling a friend of mine today that balance isn't exactly what the greatest people in the world have. They sometimes have. Ninety nine percent of their emotional, mental, scientific, spiritual energy in one direction and everything else is in the other, the other direction. And that's the scale that they live by. But we're going to remember these people because they are the Henry Fords of the world, the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, the, the people who's the Steve Jobs and the, the Bill Gates. These are the people who put 100 hours of work into a work, a work week. If you can do it, great. If you can do it, not have a family, maybe not have a goldfish, then do it. If you can put that amount of time into your craft, then that 10,000 hour conversation is legitimately the truth. You can actually have something to show for it. So you're going to spend your life watching Netflix, knowing everything that happens on every famous television show from stars, epics to Amazon or whatever you're in. The, I don't know. I mean, if you are committed to your craft, then you will put your craft first. And so for me, I'm committed to Bonita Payments. I believe in it. It provides the life that I've ever dream I've always dreamed of. It can do everything I it needs to do for my family. And if I'm good with it for the next 10 years, then I can pass it on to another generation and even pass generational wealth on. And guess what? My company enables other people to have a better life. That means a lot to me. I didn't understand that at first because my first my first thought was survive keep the lights on, be able to at least pay for what you have and so on and so forth. And then it went to, OK, well, I can pay the bills. Now let me think about a growth option. What is my growth mindset? What do I want to do to improve on what it is that I have to currently offer? So every day, lift the hood, work on your car, work on your house, make sure that your 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 finances are in order, you know, um, understand what your 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 long term strategy, short term strategy, intermediate, the whole nine. I mentioned to someone the other day that I spend every single dollar that I make on the opportunity to make more money. And everything else is a byproduct. I don't worry about the cost of coffee or gas because I am an investor. I'm on the 
front side of that decision. Sometimes I lose, sometimes I win, but you better believe that it's my money that I'm paying attention to where I'm putting it at and I'm betting on myself. It's nothing like betting on oneself, huh? Yeah. Hey, my man, thank you so much for the conversation. I really appreciate it. Appreciate Great to have you. Of course, of course, of course. Okay. And cut! Where's my director? <laughs>